Hello everyone, Mr. Lipchick here, and our topic today is Europe's physical landscape. We use maps and globes to measure the physical landscape of Europe. Uh, when studying a country's landscape, uh, various types of maps and globes are used, which include physical maps. This is the type of map that shows the physical features, such as rivers, lakes, and mountains, uh, and uses various colors, such as green for forests and blue for rivers. And there are topographical maps. This type of map is used to show the shape and elevation of an area. For instance, this area here is a hilltop. Uh, the closer together you see these lines, that is the steeper it is. Um, so what you have here is a hilltop next to a river. Uh, weather maps are used uh, to provide information about weather patterns such as precipitation, which means rain or snow. To the right you see a weather map for Europe. Political maps uh, show information about the state and national boundaries and cities. And economic maps show uh, the type of natural resources and economic activity occurring in those areas. For instance, if it's industrial, you might see a little factory uh, if it's, uh, uh, there are vineyards, you might see a little uh, group of grapes. And road maps. This is usually a detailed map that may show a local area like a city or an entire country. Uh, and the road maps are used to help you find your destination. Today with GPS, we don't think much about road maps anymore, uh, but I used them frequently when I was young. All right, Europe is the westernmost peninsula of a landmass shared with Asia, often called Eurasia. It is made up of a series of large and small peninsulas. Europe's location gives it easy access to other continents. And it is the second smallest continent, covering about 4 million square miles. Europe is a very culturally diverse continent, meaning there are many different peoples there. Uh, many of the cultures and languages are related. For instance, um, the majority of languages in Europe are considered to be of Indo-European origin. That is, they have an ancient ancestor. Uh, English is one of those languages. Not all of them are Indo-European, but uh, most of them. Europe has a great deal of coastline, which has allowed Europeans to explore and trade. It is not landlocked like some places are. And water exists in abundance, allowing for trade, agriculture, and population growth. To the right you see the Danube. There are many uh, river systems moving through Europe, which allows uh, for population exchanges. The Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the Mediterranean Sea is the body, body of water around which uh, early Western civilization emerged. It's at the bottom of Europe, uh, Europe's bottom coastline. And its calm waters allowed the Greeks and Romans to trade goods. They had very primitive ships, could not go far out to sea, but the Med is fairly calm, so they were able to trade in populations, goods, and ideas. And this allowed them to develop their higher civilization as much as anything else. Uh, it has a mild climate and it produced abundant food for the growing populations. Physical regions of Europe include the western upland, which is a mountainous region once connected to the Appalachian Mountains in North America, uh, which you will find in the Scandinavian areas, and the northern lowland, which is the Great European Plain, a fertile and flat expanse that has served as a channel for many European invasions. It's kind of a natural path that invaders have followed. Central Upland, the, mostly, uh, the most densely populated industrialized region, uh, which is rich in coal, uh, it, you know, coal uh, got the Industrial Revolution started uh, it's not used as much today in Europe, however, or anywhere in the world, but it was the prime mover of industrialization, so it makes sense that uh, that region would be the most industrialized. In the southern Alpine area, 
which is a region of alpine mountains ranging from the Pyrenees through the Alps, Carpathians, Balkans, Caucasus, and the Urals. The climate of Europe. Although Europe is a more northerly uh, country, it's at a more northerly latitude, its winters are usually less severe than North America's. And this occurs because westerly winds and the North Atlantic drift, these are uh, ocean currents, uh, bring mild winds and buffer the continent from Arctic winds. So basically it's part of the Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic drift, uh, and it peels off and it hits Europe with warm air and it blocks a lot of the cold air coming down from the Arctic. And Scandinavia and Russia, however, do not enjoy these climate protections. So if you go to Norway, Sweden, Finland, or anywhere in Russia, you will experience Arctic winds in the winter. Europe's flora and fauna. It's a fancy way for saying plants and animals. Uh, there are thousands of plant and animal species in Europe. Uh, the areas near the Arctic Circle include reindeer, polar bear, and snowy owls. Uh, there's an area called the tundra, uh, which is a treeless area between the ice cap and the tree line of Arctic regions, and it has a permanently frozen subsoil supporting low-growing vegetation such as lichens, mosses, and stunted shrubs. Okay, and uh, you will find, uh, air, you know, animals such as uh, musk ox and things like that in those areas. In northern Europe, the taiga. Uh, which is a heavily forested pine forest of, of birch and spruce, uh, you will find animals such as brown bear and lynx. And further south in northwestern Europe, a number of animals inhabit uh, woods which are made of oak, beech, and ash. For instance, the wild boar, which you see to the right, deer, and squirrels. In central Europe, uh, which is densely, uh, densely populated by farms, uh, you will find small rodents, hedgehogs, rats, shrews, hawks, and eagles. And in the Alps, you will find things such as alpine ibex, chamois, and marmots. And in the Mediterranean region, you'll find skinks and tortoises and other things. Now these, these areas are not mutually exclusive. In the Med, you will, some countries you will also find bears and deer and stuff like that. Uh, you won't find them to the degree that you find them in, in some of the other areas, but you, uh, these areas overlap, keep that in mind. Uh, one threat to Europe's wildlife is urban sprawl, just as it threatens uh, wildlife around the world. Uh, Europe's natural habitat is disappearing and has been disappearing for, for centuries. Uh, the growth of human population has led to deforestation. Areas have been cleared for agriculture and human habitation. And only about 25% of forests remain in Europe. And many species are on the brink of extinction unfortunately. That concludes our discussion of Europe's physical landscape. Thank you for attending. Look forward to seeing you in a live lesson. Have a great day.